Welcome. This lecture follows an earlier lecture that I did on the economic transformation in the 1700s. So today in this lecture, what I want to do is focus on the early 1800s, the early 19th century, to see what was happening in other regions. We had Industrial Revolution taking off in Britain. We know that eventually it works its way to continental Europe. But I want to look at some other regions, but also part of the the uh, Europe scene to see how things were, were faring. There is also going to be discussion of two um, very important economists of the early 19th century, Thomas Malthus and David Ricardo. To, be, to begin, the Industrial Revolution resulted in stunning change. R regular and tireless machines replaced human effort and in inanimate objects or sources for power replace animal sources. According to David Landis, never in the world history had both the, uh, the economy and knowledge increased at such a pace that they generated, quote, a continuing flow of improvements. The Industrial Revolution laid the foundation of the prosperity that we see today in many, in many countries. Before the Industrial Revolution, most European governments were controlled by aristocracies, the, no, the nobility. Many of these nobles, aristocrats, or if you prefer, elites, whose major source of income was from land and trading privileges, they lost power with the coming of the Industrial Revolution. Consistent with the idea of creative destruction, and this is a term associated with the 20th century economist Joseph Schumpeter, manufacturing enterprise diverted resources away from the land. Before the Industrial Revolution, in other words, the nobility, the aristocrats, had a, a significant power. They were the ones who owned the land. They had they rented the land. But now, with the rise of manufacturing, there's the allegation allocation of resources moving from the land to the cities to the factories. Now, this change in we see a change in in um, supply and demand. And one thing this meant is that landowners had to pay the workers increased wages. Again, more more people were moving to the cities for employment that paid better in the factory. Also, the emergence of these new businessmen, these entrepreneurs, they adversely affected the nobility who lost their trading privileges. So we see, we see uh, you know, significant changes throughout society. The Industrial Revolution ushered in a higher standard of living that would, that that affected uh, in a positive way, everyone, all classes. But we see that there were those who were adversely affected, and that was the aristocracy, the land holding people. Some of the changes as a result of manufacturing were, were simple, but also revolutionary. So I want to give you an example of this. I, in the economic transformation in the 1700s, I made reference to soap, and I want to just uh, add to this. The new technology of the Industrial Revolution allowed the mass production of cheap, washable cotton for clothes and soap for daily use. The common man was cleaner than ever before in history. It was the first time that commoners could afford underwear. In the past, 
only the well-to-do had washer, washable body linen. And now with this cheaper source, in an inexpensive source of cotton, ordinary people could have nicer uh, inner garments. Ordinary people were cleaner and more comfortable than many of the kings and queens of the past. The Industrial Revolution expanded from Britain to parts of continental Europe and eventually to a few areas of the Americas, most notably the northeastern United States. The much, much of the, the South was plantation slavery, and so there was not a, a much industrialization going on at all in the, the southern colonies and what became the southern states. However, in the 19th century, it did fail to root in, in many places. One example is India. India, which had the world's premier cotton industry in the 1700s. In India, there was no significant mechanization of the labor-intensive cotton industry. Indian workers, who did the spinning and weaving of cotton, lacked incentive or the means to pursue capital using technological innovations. Technology costs, it required money. It costs capital to get things going. These, the Indian workers were not in a position to be a part of that. There was always a good supply of workers for the cotton industry. To increase production, it was easier to simply hire more workers than to take the next step of investing and setting up machines and, and factories in India. Indian culture saw hard labor as appropriate. There was there's a, a cultural explanation to, involved here when we looked at why there was not the manufacturing taking off in India. Well, the, the European traders <clears throat> and charter companies that may, that would have had um, more ability to to see greater manufacturing take place in India, they basically did, didn't do much at all. They did not push for change in India. So European traders, folks who did business in India, they did not push for factories. One explanation is that this would have been a political headache for European traders to boost the uh, Indian cotton industry with mechanization. And the, the reason here is that if they did so, they would have created competition for European manufacturing interests. Perhaps a better explanation is that Indian culture, according to David Landis, favored innovation only, quote, within the conventional manual context. Moreover, there was a reluctance, the reluctance to use iron, iron in India. Indian society relied on rope and wood rather than metal, mental materials. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, shipbuilding. Indian shipbuilders primarily use ro rope and glue rather than nails. European shipbuilders would have used nails, but Indian the Indian uh, workers and craftsmen, they used glue and ropes. Another example that just gives you a, a sense of the, uh, of the 
of the divergence here when, it, when, when you speak of European culture versus Indian culture is that when the British built railways in India, so this goes back into the 19th century, the 1800s, when they built rail, railways in India, they learned that the Indian laborers moved earth and rocks in a basket on their head. And what we, we, we see here is that the, the workers, they ref, refused to use wheelbarrows. Uh, David Landis writes about this. Uh, Landis also writes that machinery was not the way for India because this, quote, would have entailed a shift from, <clears throat> from hand skills nurtured from childhood linked to uh, caste identity and division of labor by sex and age, end of quote. So David Landis is exploring the, the uh, a cultural explanation of why there was not the manufacturing in in uh, Indian society in the 1800s. The old traditional way continued to keep people employed, especially Indian women and children, restricted to a, a caste system. Another part of the world that did not witness significant mechanization and economic development in the 19th century was Latin America. Here is a quote from Latin American politician Juan Bosch, who also wrote history, and he is referring to Santo Domingo. But, but, but his, his quote is it's helpful for us to stand, help us to understand of what was taken generally in place in Latin America. Here's the quote: "We became an economy of the West, not of the most developed models of Europe, but of the Spanish model. Spain transmitted to us everything it had, its language its architect, its religion, its dress, its food, its military tradition, and its judicial and civil institutions. Wheat, livestock, sugar cane, even our dogs and chickens. But we couldn't receive from Spain Western methods of production and distribution, Tech, uh, also technique, capital and the ideas of European society. And why not? Because Spain did not have them. So Bosch here is, uh, you know, yes, the Latin America has that, obviously that direct connection to Europe, but he wanted to clarify it was the Spanish model that was left behind when it came to the you know sense of manufacturing and the industrial revolution. So I, I just actually I'm going to repeat that last sentence. But we couldn't receive from Spain Western methods of production and distribution, technique, capital, and the ideas of European society because Spain didn't have them. End of quote. Latin America in the early days of Spanish conquest, appeared to promise much. I mean, think of all the, the gold and silver that was being found and mined in Latin America and, and extracted. The Spanish and the Portuguese were proud of their fortunes, their fortunes of gold and silver, especially as they compared themselves to the lack of fortunes of the British and French in North America. In the South, there was gold and silver, something missing in the North, something missing in North America. Both the British and the French failed to find the gold that would propel their governments forward. There was, there was no, there was, they did not have any success as what what they uh, what was occurring in in the south 
now two year, uh, 200 years later, the, the story very much changes, right? By the 1800s, the wealth and potential of North America surpassed that of Latin America. North American people were richer in income per head and the distribution of wealth was more even. Individuals then were, if you make, make a capital comparison, were wealthier than the uh, South Americans and, and the Latin America greater, Central and South America. And the distribution of wealth was evener, was more even. And, and, and if you were to take a, a look at the Latin America, there would be a much greater gap between the, the people who had wealth and those who did not, whereas in North America, the gap was not as wide. When settlers came to North America, it was often with intact families. This, this is uh, part of the explanation of why North America became richer than South America. Those who came to Latin America often came as single people. Spain also did not favor the immigration of families. Spanish leaders, in addition, discouraged non-Spanish and non-Catholic businessmen and traders from doing business in Latin America. Again, this is important. So, so Spain placed some restrictions on who could do business in Latin America. Such exclusion of Protestants, for example, deprived Latin America of those with important skills and knowledge. I might make note that this was also the case in New France until the British were victorious and established their colony of Quebec. But if we look, look at the you know, St. Lawrence River Valley at the time of New France, there was uh, uh, Protestants were, were prohibited. The, the Roman Catholic Church continued to maintain the status quo it opposed political and economic reform in Latin America, and it—I it, I mean, a lot of it was they just thought that these ideas could be dangerous. Any uh, ideas that were coming in that would compete with the church, so they—they they, a, a lot of it was just you know to to, to uh, shore up their their uh, place in in society. Here's what one commentator wrote in 1852, quote, to exclude different religions in South America is to exclude the English, the Germans, the Swiss, the North Americans, which is to say the very people this continent most needs. To bring them without their religion is to bring them without the agent that makes them what they are. So this was quite a, quite an astute observation by this uh, middle 19th century commentator making, making the point that, you know, the trade-offs, there, there may have been a threat to the Catholic institution, but overall, there probably would have been better benefits. Certainly when we, when we speak of the economy, it's much better to not have restrictions of uh, you know, certain groups and culture groups and certain religions. It would have been much, much, um, much more beneficial if there would have been allowances for people of you know, multiple faiths to uh, be a part of what was happening in Latin America. Thus, Spain had an enclosed environment, and so did South America. Spain had viewed itself as the center of European civilization, 
And such myopic thinking was bad for business at home and it was bad for business with the colonies. And again, here David Landis argues that, quote, those Spanish who came to the world, New World did not go there to break the mold. They went to get rich and, and even bribe people to obtain places and offices. A few years would do the trick. The road to wealth passed not by work, but by graft and misrule. When independence did come to, Latin, to the Latin American people, it came due to the weakness and misfortunes of Spain at home. Unfortunately, the new leaders had no vision of economic development. Turning to the other side of the globe, industrialization was also very, to, very slow to de develop in Asia. I want to look at China. China, for example, was an absolute state in a political sense, meaning uh, very top down, very top down. The government referred to the as the Xing Dynasty, and actually the spelling is Q I N G. The the Xing Dynasty that began in 1644 and and lasted until uh, early into the 20th century, lasted until right up to before the First World War, 1912. The Xing Dynasty controlled life and there was no strong representation of merchants and industrialists. For centuries, China lacked educational institutions and it rejected foreign technology. At the early phase of the Industrial Revolution, King George III sent modern gifts to the Chinese emperor. But this is what, how the Chinese emperor responded. He responded and told the British that the Chinese did not need foreign devices. The, and this, this is what uh, it was recorded that he had said. The Chinese emperor declared, quote, we have never set much store on strange or ingenious objects, nor do we need any more of your country's manufacturers, end of quote. When we looked at Confucianism, Confucianism looked down on scientific research, looked down on you know these these this modern way of, of thinking the it, basically this this religion had viewed other european anything kind of european or other Euro, european influences uh, with contempt similar to the case of india there was ample a number of cheap labor and and w so why why bother with mechanization there was always going to be enough people to get the work done now as a result of this it, you see that poverty was the norm in in China My, uh, you know the, the the political leaders the politicians are you know they're they're pr protecting their their place in society, and and they and they think they're they're doing the proper thing, but this has a, a dire consequences for the common masses. Here's a, here's one commentator who who wrote uh, uh, who traveled and and uh, lived in China and he, and he wrote about what he saw. This is from the mid 19th century. So the, you know, the mid, 18, mid, mid 1800s. And he describes the misery. Quote, 
unquestionable, there can be found in no other country such a depth of disastrous poverty in the celestial empire. Not a year passes in which a terrific number of persons do not do not perish of famine in some part or other of China. The multitude of those who live merely from day to day is incalculable. Let a drought, a flood, or any accident whatever occur to injure the harvest in a single province, and two-thirds of the population are immediately reduced to starvation. You see them forming up into numerous bands, perfect armies of beggars, and proceeding together, men, men, women, and children, to seek some little nourishment in the towns and villages. Now, one has to be be reflective about these these this type of description, the because we just have one individual here, and we have to be cautious when with the language here especially if you're talking about there i mean he he mentions a number here he said that two-thirds of the population of this area would have been reduced to starvation so we have to be a little skeptical but nonetheless there there is something to this i mean obviously there there were there was misery in in china and um, if, if he doesn't quite have the numbers correct, that still doesn't mean he's, he's wrong. In Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, Thomas Sowell, the economist Thomas Sowell, argues that the Chinese rejection of modern items was a catastrophic error. And this is what he wrote, quote, since no, cult, no given culture is better in all things, much less for all time, a lack of uh, receptivity to the cultural advances made, uh, made by others is a self-imposed isolation that can be as damaging as isolation imposed by geography. Thomas Sowell is one who, who sees the importance of there being, you know, exchange between different groups of people, different nations and different cultures. And he sees it as a, a problem, an economic problem, when people isolate themselves. Some of the isolation that, that we see in world economic history was a result of geography, you know, living on an island or living, living in the mountains. But this here was a self-imposed isolation that brought with it um, dire problems for, for many people. The poor state of the Chinese economy opened the door for domestic rebellion. And this is where, where we see that there is, uh, obviously there's something wrong, wrong that, uh, the, the Chinese, situ Chinese situation was, was problematic because there was rebellion. And, and this, you know, points to how, how bad things were. So we have a domestic rebellion breaking out in China. The largest rebellion of the 19th century, in 19th century world history was the, the Taiping Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion broke out Exactly mid 19th century, it was 1850, and it lasted 14 years. It went from 1850 to 1864. And this rebellion fed off the chaos of popular discontent and government uh, incompetence. Forming the Society of God Worshippers. This affected people from China's remote southwest traveled to the Yangtze River where others gathered. The, the platform of the Taiping cult and the, the leader himself actually saw himself as, as a god. 
the platform of this cult included the abolition of private property and also they wanted to, to have instead the communal sharing of wealth. And, and, and basically what, what we have here is a, an, er, uh, an earlier form of communism. Well, there, there was a showdown, a showdown over power between the Taipings and the Chinese government. By the end, in 1864, the Taiping Rebellion had left around 30 million Chinese dead. And there, there, I, I've come across various numbers, but even the more conservative numbers uh, put it at about 20 million Chinese dead as a result of the Taiping Rebellion. In addition to that, millions were in a state of poverty and hunger in these war-torn regions. I mean, you have a conflict that lasted uh, 14 years. For survival, many Chinese resorted to eating grass and there were even cases of cannibalism. Just so, just horrific conditions for, the, for these poor people. Attempts to reform China after the Taiping Rebellion failed to bring significant economic improvement. There was, there was some uh, acceptance of, 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 of Western ways, but the, the, the impact was minimal. We have the Europeans coming in, there's, you know, there's, there's ships, there's, there's, there's uh, railways being built, there's, there's mining, there's telegraphs, uh, and and all of this uh, begins in this period in the late in the second half of the 19th century but the economic impact is is quite quite minimal uh, there were even obstacles for uh, various European nations when it comes to the industrial revolution so mechanization uh, failed to take root, for example, in, in parts of, of Europe. Uh, across the English Channel, like nearby, next, next door to, to Britain, we have France. And France offers a very interesting case. The Seven Years' War, the war, the major war that took place between France and Britain, and this uh, war, Seven Years' War, was from the year 15, uh, sorry, uh, 1756 and lasted up until 1763. This Seven Years' War, which France lost, basically left France broke. Now, French kings continued state spending while borrowing money at the same time. And this is, this is problematic. It's going, to, it's, it's going to catch up to them. Borrowing at high rates required the government to pay out huge sums in interest on these loans, and um, things get worse as each year passes. And, and, and as we approach the end of the 1700s, France is in, in pretty, uh, pretty bad shape economically. The, while, while the British government was, was you know, supporting mechanization and industrialization, the French monarchy continued to maintain the, you know, more of the, the absolutism and, and, and like the, the feudal, uh, feudalism, the uh, feudal state. And this meant that most of the taxation was, was by the third estate, which, which was approximately 95, 96% of the population. The, the nobility were able to e evade taxes. The, <clears throat> the church didn't have to pay taxes, but everyone else had to. And so, well, what we have is the, the tax burden is on the common masses in France. 
there, there was some manufacturing, but it was highly regulated. The aristocrats, the nobility, saw, sought to protect their wealth from the advances of entrepreneurs. Well, this leads to the French Revolution, the famous Revo French Revolution that breaks out in the year 1789. And the revolution marked the end of the feudal system, but the revolution itself runs out, uh, sp spins out of control as radicals take over and it was a what what may had looked looked promising initially turned out to be uh, very uh, horrific very ugly tens of thousands of innocent people being executed well after the Fr French Re Revolution and it and it basically runs out of steam by, you know, a few years later, so we're talking about the mid-1790s, thereafter there, there continued to be political instability, and it wasn't until the, the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte that, that um, there was any kind of uh, sense of getting back to, to more, more stable times. As, as a leader, N N Napoleon Bonaparte reformed the government. The, he had these so-called government experts uh, who replaced the representative institutions and local government. Now, there was, there was no meaningful elections with uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, but his Code Napoleon, referred to as the Code Napoleon, did recognize property rights. Napoleon also oversaw the establishment of the Bank of France, a bank that stabilized the French currency and provided capital for investment. So these were, these were positive signs. But there was no magic formula, however, and industrialization in 19th century France, and well, especially the, the first half of the 19th century, lagged, lagged behind. Uh, certainly, France was nowhere the mechanization, industrialization that, that took place in, in Britain. The, with, with the Industrial Revolution came uh, commentators who wrote on the economy. So this is where I want to move to look at two uh, uh, early economists, economists of the early 19th century. And it was, uh, this, this is a really important uh, transition, I guess, when we talk about economic theory, because now we have uh, some really important people, you know, thinking and writing ab about the economy and providing some really good assessments on uh, what was taking place on the ground. The first person we want to look at is, is Thomas Robert Malthus. And he was one who focuses his attention on the issue of overpopulation. Malthus, who was born in 1766 and lived until 1834, was born in South East England. He studied at Cambridge University, where he studied mathematics and philosophy. He was ordained in the Church of England, but he later taught economics at a college near London. And one historian, suggests or or yes argues that he, he was probably the first academic economist he wrote a very important book entitled essays on population this came out just two years before we enter into the 19th century so 1798 essays uh, sorry essay on population 
And this book brought Malthus immediate fame, instant fame. Malthus adopt, adopted the provocative position that human betterment was impossible. Well, that's, that's rather pessimistic. Human betterment was impossible. Impossible. Well, basically what, he's, what he was arguing was that societies could not escape misery and poverty. In fact, he argued that any attempt to alleviate poverty would only worsen the problem. His argument depended on two major points. Humans were driven by sexual pleasure which led to overpopulation. Population increases were geometric. That is, the pattern was doubling. And so doubling, you got one to two. That doubling one, one, one plus one is two. But then you double that, two plus two is four. Four plus four is eight, and so on and so on. This is how he saw population increasing, geometric. Second, there was diminishing returns in agriculture production. There was, in other words, the, the farming was, could, could not increase, the, the quantity could not increase. It was a matter of time that the best land would be used up. And once the best land is used up, the the um, quantity of crops will will level off. It certainly will not advance as as uh, as fast as population. This is his argument, and and he he basically was saying that you know once once the good all the good land is used. Uh, that's pretty much it because, you know, any, any other land that's set aside for agriculture is, is going to be inferior. It's not, you're not going to have the richness and quantity of crops from inferior, from inferior land. And for Malthus, the best one could hope for was an increase of food production at, at arithmetical proportions. That is, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. That's the best. He he didn't see how the uh, quantity, the increase of for of food production, could get any better than that. Well, if you compare the two, right? In the case of population, the population we have a, a doubling pattern, but this pattern is just by by one, one, two, three, four, five. Because population growth outpaced food production, it was inevitable that the population would eventually use up all the available food. This is what he was arguing. It, it, it was a, a bleak formula. It, there's, there's really nothing one could do. This is, this is what was going to happen. Of course, this would lead to the next gloomy step, which was starvation. There's not enough food for the people. Malthus saw no hope in government assistance. If poor people received poor relief from the government, they would continue to have more children. Thus, there would be more poor people. In his writing years later, he gave another reason for his opposition to relief for the poor. He argued that poor relief would increase demand for food. For example, the price of corn would rise. Higher prices would hurt all of society. Malthus was also interested in the issue of these of depression, economic depressions, like the, the periodic depressions that would that would happen. 
he concluded that economic glut, you know, you, you, business was slow and unemployment was high, that these gluts were due to insufficient demand or inadequate spending. His solution was for the government to see that businessmen had less income and landowners more income. Well, what's, what's behind this? How, how, how is this a solution where businessmen had less income and landowners had more? Well, here's how he saw it. As he saw it, the difference between businessmen and landowners is that businessmen saved rather than invested their money at times of gluts, where, whereas the landowners would hire more workers with any additional income. Uh, interesting, but this is what he believed. And for such thinking, uh, some see Malthus as a, almost like a forerunner of Keynesian economics. Malthus was uh, is, is an important economist to, to look at, especially given that even in more modern times there there are these you know neo -Malth, uh, who who are pushing, for families not to have, uh, not to, for people not to have, ch couples to have big families. And uh, 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 this, this stuff has been debunked. Malthus' ideas have been debunked, but he had a significant influence on a lot of people's thinking when it came to the economy. One person that he did not agree with on many on many economic issues was uh, David Ricardo, and but actually they were friends. They were friends. Uh, David Ricardo was born in 1772, and he, born into a prosperous Jewish family. Ricardo was uh, gifted intellectually. He entered his father's brokerage firm at the age of 14. Uh, his father, however, did disown him when he married a Quaker and he converted to Christianity. When he, when he and his wife were on a vacation in 1799, he stumbled upon Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Recall Adam Smith seen as sort of the father of modern economics in his important, very important book, classic book, Wealth of Nations, that was published in 1776. Well, David Ricardo stumbles upon it, and he reads it. And, it, and uh, what Smith was writing fascinated him. And he begins this, uh, studying economics whenever he had time. Here's an individual <coughs> who... Uh, you know, before had not um, really given much thought of, of, of this topic, but now he's really, really passionate about learning economics. Ricardo made important contributions to economics, but the one he's best known for is his theory of comparative advantage. Well, first let me explain absolute advantage. Absolute advantage is when a nation produces various things cheaper or better than another nation. And I'll give you one example. A South American nation, nation that has, you know, a banana industry has an absolute advantage over a northern nation, and we could take Canada, for example, the the southern nation is obviously going to have an advantage when it when it comes to having you know production of bananas so that's absolute advantage then there is the idea of comparative advantage the comp the idea of the comparative advantage that falls basic economics that scarce resources have alternate uses 
Ricardo's comparative advantages, advantage provides evidence that foreign trade is the best option for all nations. He shows that through specialization. Two countries will gain from each other by way of trading. And <clears throat> Uh, th this is the, uh, of, of really of, of great importance, especially among uh, the people who who want to see you know greater free trade, trade before nations, and you need to go back to David Ricardo and his comparative advantage to to you know understand how it's much better for there to be you know open trade. Now beyond theory. Comparative advantage is also an important fact in the history of many parts of the world. Over a century ago, Britain stopped producing enough food to feed its population. Britain didn't even, didn't even try to have uh, all, all its crops uh, um, to, to, feed, to feed everyone. Why? Why would they stop producing food? Because of Britain's comparative advantage with manufacturing, shipping, and financial risk services, it had more than enough money to purchase food to feed its population. And uh, with, 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 this, with the money that, that the British had, the wealth that it was creating as a result of its manufacturing, it can bring in foods uh, from other areas. And also this means, you know, a greater variety of foods because there's, there's foods that, the, that could not be grown in Britain can be now I imported. And as a result, British ate better when, uh, <coughs> they, they ate much better than it was the case when they, they grew their own food to feed themselves. It, it made really no sense to transfer resources from manufacturing to agriculture production. <clears throat> Another example I want to give you is the like cocoa grown in West Africa. Be, because of their success with cocoa, <clears throat> Because of the success with cocoa production, West African farmers devoted less attention to other crops. They didn't want to, to, to spend um, much of their efforts growing other crops because they, they recognized that they had an advantage in growing cocoa and their, their increased earnings from cocoa farm, farming and now enabled them to purchase a greater variety of food elsewhere. Ricardo is recognized as the leading economist of the early 19th century. On many economic issues, he disagreed with his friend Thomas Malthus. There are many letters actually between each other really do offer an, an excellent window, a, a view of, you know, this emerging uh, uh, economic theory and, and just uh, this more um, trying to understand, you know, what, what, what's happening, you know, how, how an economy works. And they were, you know, many letters, dozens and do dozens of letters back and forth, you, you know, discussing. And a lot of things they didn't agree with, but but they were, they respected each other. In fact, I, I have a quote here that, that apparently Malthus had, had said at, at David Ricardo's funeral. So David Ricardo passed first and, and Malthus is reported to have said, quote, I never loved anybody out of my own family so much. Our interchange of, of opinions was so unreserved and the, and the object after which we were both inquiring was so entirely the truth and nothing else 
that I cannot but think we sooner or later must have agreed. So he, he was, uh, we have a, you know, very close relationship between these two and, and we get, uh, uh, just a wealth of information as, as a result of the letters between the two. To summarize this lecture, the, the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Re Revolution ushered in an era of prosperity for all classes never, be, never seen in world history. In the past, when there was, you know, prosperity, it was usually the case of theft, you know, pillaging. We, we would have, you know, various empires built on people uh, by way of force, just, just uh, taking over land and extracting what they wanted. And, but, but normally, the, the ones who benefited from this would have been, the, you know, the, the, the elites, the, the politicians, the leaders. Here, with the Industrial Revolution, what takes place, it provides um, benefits for, for everyone. Everyone has, um, before them, will have more, uh, more expensive, inexpensive clothes and, and shoes, and just just commod various commodities. Because in what was the past when you had artisans doing, um, creating these things, there's, there's no way the, they could uh, compete with the factories that were producing various products and, and what people were buying at at uh, a much uh, much lower price than what the art artisans could do so it was a it was an era of prosperity and it, it, it's pretty hard to deny that especially if you look at numbers of like the population how the population was advancing uh, because people were just you know living healthier eating eating healthier but all, but not all nations welcomed manufacturing, and, and we saw we see this with the example of of India and, and China. You know, I want I want to, I should I should make the note that you, these choices by by political leaders, you know, it's not anything that is necessarily going to be the case forever. And, and, and what we see, even if we advance or to the late 20th century, we, we see that India has, uh, has embraced, and embraced um, a, a more a different uh, system of economic uh, theory and production and are, are doing, doing much better comparatively than they were before. And this is something that economist Thomas Sowell is, uh, you know, wants to point out, is that you, you have different people groups in different nations that have maybe, may, maybe not made the best choices for their people as regards to economic prosperity, but that does not mean that that's always going to be the case. So we have we have many examples of different people groups who do not have a, a very good record in the past who who went on to do very well and had had embraced more more productive way of of doing their economy and and this is what I want to just um, leave you with uh, one co uh, one quote from Thomas Sowell quote. There is nothing automatic about prosperity. Standard of living that we take for granted today have been achieved only within a few minute fraction of the history of the human race. Standard of living far below what we would consider to be poverty have been the norm for untold 
thousands of years. In other words, what what we when we when we look at world history and we we compare economic history over the centuries, we can see that since the mid 1700s something really astonishing had happened where we we have uh, a standard of living for for uh, societies to be unimaginably um, impressive compared to in the past. The norm, the norm in history is that people had very difficult lives, uh, economic wise anyway. I mean, standard of living. And one can choose, can, can select, you know, any century, any century in world history before the Industrial Revolution to see this. The economic theories of Malthus and Ricardo marked the beginning of more attention on the principles of economics and what was proper path for societies to take. Karl Marx would have his say, and this will be a focus of a, another lec lecture, taking a look at what, what Karl Marx had to say about manufacturing and the industrial revolution that takes root in an increasing number of nations into the 19th century, particularly within Europe. So I'll just leave it at there. there. Thank, thank you very much.